Hello, and welcome to another episode of LGO TV. It's LGO TV Big Talk. And why Big Talk? Because I hate small talk. And my guest today is somebody who not only thinks about Big Talk, she thinks about really important, super trustworthy Big Talk. Margot Bloomstein is a friend of mine and also the author of this new incredible book called Trustworthy, How the Smartest Brands Beat Cynicism and Bridge the Trust Gap. Now, we're living in a really interesting time where, you know, trust is kind of, I don't know, it's an opinion sometimes and not a fact. Mm -hmm. And I want to spend some time today talking about truth versus fact and how we can actually create trust among ourselves, among the people we love, among the people we lead, among the people who, 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 who we follow. And I want to do that by bringing on Margot, who is an incredible expert on the subject. Margaret Bloomstein is one of the most prominent voices in the content strategy industry. She's an internationally recognized keynote speaker and the author of this great book, Trustworthy, How the Smartest Brands Beat Cynicism and Bridge the Trust Gap. She's an industry mainstay, and, and oh, sorry, and her, and her previous book, which is an industry mainstay, content strategy at work, real world stories to strengthen every interactive product project. I'm having a tough time oh, with yeah. words, Margo. So before we started talking, Margo was, uh, we were, you know, we did the thing that you do where you talk to guests and you're like, just remind me how to pronounce your name. Let me pronounce your name, et cetera. And Margo said that uh, when her name is mispronounced, it's mispronounced not as Margo Bloomstein, but as Marmot Bloodstain. And yeah, I said, well, not I'm mispronounced, but that's what word thinks I am. That's what, oh, sorry. That's what word thinks you are. Right. Well, I get <laughs> Laura Grassfed Otter. So the otters, the marmots, were coming together today to help people figure out trust. Now you've been doing this for more than twenty years. I want to hear what got you into this work in the first place. Well, I think my my background is in not content, not writing, but in design. And when I was kind of coming up, when I came out of college, it was sort of height of the dot com boom and then bust. And as I spoke with with different agencies and was kind of interviewing around. In a number of those conversations, I was hearing, well, these are the types of questions we ask. These are the sort of topics we focus on. Tell us what you think about this. And my focus tended to be not just on the, the visual communication of organizations, but also how they, how they kind of own their message, how they identify their message and what makes them unique, what makes them valuable, how they resonate in the hearts and minds of their target audience. And it turned out that's really the focus more of content strategy. And it was kind of through the interviewing process that that I realized that. And um, and then wonderful friends who became mentors and managers eventually steered me in that direction to say, hey, you know, you should really f talk with the folks that are doing that kind of work. And that's kind of that was my entry into content strategy. And that's where I've been practicing the past 20 some years. And uh yeah, and then that led me into looking at what makes content itself trustworthy as well. So I think it's super interesting because, as you know, I spent 20 years doing executive search, and uh, my job was to interview people and hear their stories and figure out what made them tick. And, you know, I was the CEO of the company for 15 of those years, company that I founded. And so by the time I interviewed people, they were qualified for the job. They, you know, they had the basic resume that was going to say they could lead this organization. But it was my job to figure out not what they could do, but how they did it and why, mm -hmm. most importantly, they did it. Because, you know, when somebody gives you the backstory and you find out why they actually do the work they do, that's how you know that they're going to be the one who really shows up when things, you know, when shit hits the fan. That's the, they're going to really bring their best and they're going to be in it with you. And so for me, the way that I did that was it wasn't necessarily listening to all the things they told me. But it was hearing what they didn't tell me. It was their body language. It was how they presented themselves. It was how they approached the story. And so I'm so interested in how, you know, design is part of that element because that's what you do as a designer before you get to the words, right? It's like, what are you showing people and how do you make them feel by the way something's even laid out or the images that you choose or even the font or any of that stuff? But then you layer on top of that the words. Right, right. And I think as I was starting to study design and, and kind of learn more about it and develop the vocabulary to even express like some of those those elements and, and questions that you were just posing, the thing that hit me, and granted, this was probably in the um the sort of utopian optimism of being a college student and you know, mm. thinking I know a little bit, so I must know everything. Um, and and then realizing 
throughout the rest of your career just how wrong that is and how that's a wonderful gift. But uh, it was increasingly hitting me that as you understand an organization, as you come to understand an organization and the audience they want to engage, whether that's mm -hmm. an external audience or in the, in the case of recruitment, maybe an internal audience or people that you're trying to bring within the organization, that if you can design, if you can make those design choices as perfect and, and if you can optimize them as much as possible, maybe, maybe it is possible to create an experience without having any words in it because the nature of the design itself, the, the color scheme, the density of information within that experience, the, the typography, which would naturally lend itself to shaping words, but the typography that you choose as well, that all of that is enough to create the kind of experience that you want uh, to frame that rhetorical arena between the brand and and their audience. And of course, that's that's an ideal. And, and maybe we have this sort of almost asymptotic experience ever trying to reach for it, even though we don't actually want to attain it. But you you shoot for the moon and you land among the stars. And I think that with with designing an experience and understanding the overall message behind it and the communication goals, that's how design and content, the words that we choose, the content types, the visual imagery and, and what goes into that imagery that we choose, that's how they end up on the same page to create a consistent, cohesive experience. And, and I think creating that cohesive experience that's what we start to talk about now when we talk about other buzzwords in marketing like authenticity and when we're when we want to create that authentic experience for for our audiences that has to go back to consistency you know i think one of the things that that i have been struck by so much in the last 6 years of i i you know sold the recruiting firm and i uh, became a, a speaker and an author is that I started off with my messages as the like, okay, what's the market looking to buy? Let me create something and put the messages out there that, and what I realized was that it, I, I wasn't very successful because the market didn't care. Like there was 17 other just like me. And it wasn't until I was like, well, what's my message? What do I have to talk about? That's real. That's in my voice. That's, 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 um, that's authentic in a way that, resonates with people where they can see themselves in me. That's where I started to get a little bit more successful. But then I ran into the the the, the same problem I had originally, which was like, okay, now I have this thing I'm going to like push it out into the world. And I wasn't necessarily thinking about the user experience, right? So like once mm -hmm. they're like, yes, we resonate with that. Now what? Like, where do they go? How do they go deeper? How do you develop the relationship? And so I love that in Trustworthy, you talk about voice finding your voice, what does it look like? Who, you know, what's the messages you're putting out there? You talk about vulnerability, right? Like being who you are, being authentic, but you also talk about volume. And I think the volume piece is where for me, that's where it sort of all fell apart because I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about the user experience, like mm -hmm. how are they feeling and how are they getting it? And I think that happens so often that we we create something, a product, an image, a, a message, and we put it out into the world because we're we're pushing it out there, but we're not thinking about where our customers and clients are coming from. So like I think right. it's hard to create trust with somebody when you're telling them where you're where you are the only voice of the narrative. Right, right. And I think, so when I talk about volume in the book, I'm describing how do you know how much to say? What's the volume of information, the volume of detail, the, um, the, the level of detail that goes into a diagram or the number of images in a photo gallery? How do you know how much to say mm -hmm. to appropriately engage that audience? And ultimately, so that they feel confident in themselves, that they have enough information to make a good decision about what they're hearing, to, to believe in you. Because if they feel confident in themselves, then they can feel confident in you too. And I think that's how how we operationalize trust in a lot of ways. Yeah, because that's what happens, right? I think a lot of people um, put something out there thinking that the customer's there for them, right? The customer's <laughs> there to buy the product, the customer's there to read the story, the customer's there to press like or like whatever it is. I but it's not until we think like we exist because the customer, like we exist because of those people. So we're really there for them. 
but there's a line between thinking about the customer experience and who they're going to be and how they're going to be how they're going to interact with you and pandering. Right. And also not losing yourself in that experience. Yes. Maybe that is pandering. And I don't know, maybe pandering is also the kind of the flip side of imposter syndrome. When we put ourselves out there to a degree that we're like, oh, here I am. I, I don't have any footing here. I've been mm -hmm. faking it till I make it. And when is somebody going to realize that maybe I'm faking it? Um, I think that's when we when we kind of extend ourselves beyond ourselves, beyond our own our own unique attributes that that make us uniquely valuable, that that make us not just one of many, but the only one. I think that that pandering, that's what creates imposter syndrome. When we when we try too hard to give them something that they want that we are not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've always thought fake it till you make it is like the worst thing possible because uh, number one, you're so busy faking it till you make it that by the time you actually make it, you don't even know if it's the thing you want because you're not even exploring it on the way up. Number two, you, once you get to that place, you're going to make mistakes and you're not going to know what to do because you haven't spent any time learning. Yeah. You've just spent time pretending. And number three, I think sometimes when we're so busy faking it, we actually miss the great conversations and the richness of the experience that's around us. And we don't get we don't get any better. We don't get any better. We don't understand ourselves. We don't learn anything. And it's 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 like it's like this house of cards, right? It all sort of falls apart. But you mm. actually don't find yourself in that because you're so busy just trying to find someone else and be someone else. Yeah. And trustworthy, as you as you so eloquently describe in the book, really starts with helping your helping your 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 customers, your citizens make better decisions. And that has to come from a place of you really understanding what you're talking about enough so that they can feel like they've gotten enough information that they can confidently make that, those decisions. I love that definition mm -hmm. that you give in the book. Well, I think it starts with first know thyself. You know, it's that mm -hmm. not sodom carved over the, I think the entrance to the temple in Delphi or something like that, mm -hmm. or the entrance to the door. Yeah, first know who you are before you can attempt to engage or help or empower others. And and I think that ultimately though, it leads toward how we empower others to make better decisions, to feel mm -hmm. more confident in their own knowledge, whether it's it's about what we're selling or about what we're asking them to do if we're trying to persuade them. And I think it it's about having that, if we wanna have that kind of two-way trustworthy conversation, we need to respect the parties at both ends. We need to respect mm. what makes us unique, whether you're you're kind of representing yourself or representing a brand or organization, as well as respect the the needs and as you said, the the baggage and the context of our audiences. I think it's in that that kind of equation, that sort of balance between the two parts that we can develop compassion too. And yeah. I know we talk a lot about empathy and um and in the book, I kind of pushed back on that. That was like one of the things that I learned in writing the book. One of the people that I interviewed who's a designer and shares her, her personal story in the book about what she learned in engaging with a really hard, a really hard family situation centered around end of life care and, and health care and, and her own kind of reckonings with the healthcare system. Um, one of the things that she shared with me is that she thought that this idea of empathy is arrogant that we we when we try to empathize with people by understanding their experience by comparing it to our own that requires us to assume that we we do share an experience and mm -hmm. there are many ways in which we don't but we don't have to in order to respect someone else we don't have to have had the same lived experiences instead we could just try to to be compassionate to them to respect them for what they're going through and who they are and say that's enough. I can respect you just for that. And then we can start to understand and build a shared experience and, and offer them things that empower their own experience. Yeah, I, that's, it's, it's, it's so good. It's so good. I know you've got uh, kids that are uh, younger than mine. Um, and this is, I think the greatest piece of parenting advice I ever got from somebody uh, was somebody whose kids were my age when my kids were your age, right? I sat down and I was like, you've got such a 
great experience, such a great relationship with your kids. How did you must have done something right? How did you do mm -hmm. it? Like, I want to do that. And basically what she said is don't solve their problems. Don't solve their problems. Like if you, they come to you with a problem and you immediately say, oh yeah, I was in a high school once. I know that sucks. Here's what you should do. They're like, okay, you yeah. can't relate to me. You don't know what this is like. This is my pain. You can't feel it. Like no matter how hard you try to empathize, it actually is worse because you make them feel bad. Like, yeah, I was through that. Now I'm fine. So let me tell you, right? Like right. why you're doing this wrong. And basically what she said is your only response to them should just be, oh, that sucks. Yeah. It's amazing. It is the greatest thing. First of all, it takes all of the pressure off you to actually have an answer. But just <laughs> saying, that sucks. That must really hurt. I'm sorry you're yeah. going through it. All of a sudden, it's like, yeah, it does. It does suck. And then they want to talk to you about it. And suddenly you can like help them find mm -hmm. solutions. But the difference between um, uh, empathizing and just having compassion, I love what you said because the 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 empathy actually broke trust when I would try to do that with my children. And it gained trust when I just gave them compassion and I let them be seen and actually yeah. have valid uh, validity in their feelings. Yeah. And to own their own experience. Yes. That, that resonates with me so much as a parent, but also as a colleague and a friend, because you think of so many times when I think even when my clients come to me and say, here's what's going on first that, yeah, they just want to be validated that that is a problem that yeah. sucks it, or friends that say, here's what I'm dealing with. And, and I've seen how it works so well sometimes to say to people, do you want a solution or do you just want an ear? And nine yes. times out of 10, they just want a, a kind and compassionate and listening ear to say, yes. yeah, wow, what you're going through is horrible. And, and I think that being able to start from that point, sometimes that's the start and the end and that's all the people need. But, but you're right, I think as a parent, to be able to just start on that point of saying, that's a horrible thing that you're dealing with. Yeah. Whatever, whatever the scale of it is, um, that that offers that kind of validation so that people can can continue to be in control of the situation too, to not have their not have us wrest their power from them, but so that they can continue to to own the problem, own the solution, and know that they don't have somebody in their corner with a solution, but they have somebody in their corner with support. Yes. It's always going to be in their corner. Yes. And I think that that's so important, especially when you're dealing with little kids too, that um, are learning to become capable people and learning what it means to, to kind of own a solution, take responsibility for a solution, but also own their own mistakes and to own the learning process. I think that 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 aspect of owning the learning process. I don't know, maybe it's because maybe it's being child children of the 80s, but that I think can be so scary and intimidating and almost shameful for so many of us. Like I was saying, you know, in college when I had a little bit of knowledge, so I thought I had it all. It was like I didn't quite understand maybe the the denominator there and, and how big it was. <laughs> um, but as I have as I've progressed in my career, I think that's the biggest thing that I've discovered, just that the scope of what I don't know is much grander and more wonderful than I could have imagined. And that that's an okay thing, that it allows me to, to not adopt this false pretense of beginner's mind, but to walk into so many situations and say, tell me more. I don't know enough about that yet. And uh, yes. such a wonderful opportunity. It, it, it absolutely is. I mean, I think, I think having children actually has made me a better uh, consultant. I think it's made me a better friend. I think it's made me a better daughter. I think it's made me uh, a, a, a better manager because the thing about allowing somebody to be seen in their failure, mm -hmm. but not defined as a failure I think is such a, a, an important step of building that relationship of trust. And, you know, you talk in your book a lot about vulnerability and how vulnerability mm -hmm. is so important. I feel like there are so many leaders who say, um, you know, failure is good. Let's fail. Let's fail fast. Let's not fail mistakes. Yeah. But don't you fail, right? Like <laughs> we should all fail, but you can't fail. And, and, and don't come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution. It's like, well, come to me with an open mind of exploration, right? And some options. Yeah. I don't want you just to drop a problem on my lap. But 
expecting perfection, I think what you do that what you're doing as a leader then is asking your people to hide. You're asking your people to hide their true selves. I mean, I I think there's a huge difference between being loved and being seen, right? Like mm -hmm. actually being seen for who you are and accepted and celebrated is a whole lot different than the transactional like you get good grades, you give you do the assignment well, you um, you know, land the big deal, we'll 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 give you some love in whatever that is, whether it's, you know, family love or promotion right. or whatever. But this idea of really seeing people, allowing them to be seen and letting them see you, I think is so important in building trust. So I'm sort of interested in your take on the green screen as we're all been, as you've all been working from home for the last year. My, oh gosh. I mean, no, no green screen here. I've got kind of the, the periwinkle <laughs> wall um, that I will never hide away because the, that periwinkle wall is evidence of poor choices and procrastination and <laughs> oh um that that periwinkle wall came about because it was like 12 30 at night and i was supposed to be working on edits from my from feedback from my editor on chapter four and so i developed this sort of I don't know, myopia maybe, or or maybe where I just couldn't focus on the middle ground of the work that I needed to do. And instead was like, what are all the other things that I need to do? Well, I need to paint my office at 1230 at night <laughs> rather than face the work in front of me. Um, but it gave me kind of the time and space to let ideas percolate in the back of my head so that once I sat down even later that night to work, I could and smell paint drying behind me. Again, bad choices there. I mean, you know, what did, what is what is that quote that's often misattributed to Hemingway, dr uh, write drunk, edit sober? I mean, or, you were like editing on fumes, so maybe you yeah, were a little bit. Yeah. Or, or edit with Sherwin-Williams. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Ask Sherwin-Williams. Yeah. He'll give yeah. you an answer. Um, but, but, but there is something to that, right? Like sometimes we have to, you know, Rahaf Harfush, uh, my, my, my dear friend, talks about hustle and float, right? Where there's times wow. that you hustle and there are times that you float. And when you allow yourself that time to float, you actually get better at the hustle. You get better at the work. Like they're, they're my favorite, it, it, the, the book is terrific. My favorite, um, my favorite stat of the entire book is that they showed people who like sat down to work eight hour days. And even if you were like committed to sitting there eight hour days in front of your computer, you only really got six hours of good work done. Yeah. So even if you're super committed, there's, you have to take time in between to let your brain rest and to float and to alchemize all the ideas into something right. else that's even better. So, I mean, I, 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 the, 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 the morning person in me is like twitching at the thought of even starting anything, let alone paying an offer at twelve thirty. But, but, but I think, but I think being able to tell that story then tells me something about you. Like the idea of this green screen is like I want to hide away who I am. And by the way, not only am I hiding away who I am, and I don't want you to get to know me. I never wanted you to get to know me in the first place, right? Which is why I've like blocked this. Like I like seeing people dirty laundry because mm -hmm. it makes me feel better about my dirty laundry. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't know that I agree. Even though I don't use a green screen, I guess I look at it less as hiding things away and more, I mean, this is almost kind of like a, in contrast to the fake it till you make it. Yes. It's more use your illusion, like mm. make it what you need it to be whether that is spending time painting to get your brain where you need it to be, or the stuff around you is not the stuff that allows you to focus or allows the person on the screen to focus on you. You need to envision yourself in front of a, you know, a, a sunny tropical backdrop or in outer space, wherever it takes you that day. I say, make it what you need it to be. Um, RuPaul, you know, we're all born naked. Everything else is drag. And I think that this, it's all drag. however we curate it, whether it is with a green screen or with things that look organized up till like here and then fall apart out there. <laughs> yes. I think, yeah, or, it's, all, it's yeah. all drag. So make it what you need it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I accept. I accept. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk about... Can we talk about Rachel Hollis for a moment? Let's do it. Okay. Not to drag another woman through the mud. I don't want to do that, but I'm interested in your take on the Rachel Hollis 
fiasco that's happening right now. Where have you been keeping up with this story? A little bit. I'll let I'll let you set up context. Okay. So the context is this, and again, I don't. We don't need to drag her personally, but I want to talk about this as just an example of something where people were shocked because she showed a side of herself that was not what she had been selling. So she uh, uh, posted something, uh, an, in a, a video on Instagram, where basically she said. Um, so I wrote something the other day and somebody came at me about, you know, saying that I have a cleaning woman. And I just mm -hmm. want to say, yeah, I have a cleaning woman. I have a woman who comes to my house. She cleans my house. She cleans my toilets. She comes to my house twice a week and cleans my toilets. And this woman was upset with me about it and saying that I wasn't relatable. What part of me made you think that I want to be relatable? Like that's what she did, like crazy eyes into the camera. She's like every single, literally every single thing I've done in my life has so that I could, so that I could live a life that is unrelatable to most people. All the people I've ever admired in my life, all the women are unrelatable. And then she, in the caption, um, mentions Michelle Obama, Oprah, Malala, Harriet Tubman. I mean, it's like, you're comparing yourself to Harriet Tubman. Like, yeah. Yeah. And the, the issue with it is not the like complete ridiculous tone deaf, whatever, like we won't go there. I don't want to drag her. But the fact that all these women were like, y you, you literally have written books about how you're so relatable, how you're a hot mess, how you have stretch marks like everybody else. So like, if I can get up and do it, you can get up and do it. And the backlash that she's getting is specifically because what she, it's not like she, there was like, just like a post, like it was like a video of her going full on diva moment. Yeah. completely opposite from what she's done. So how do we can unpack why that's not trustworthy? I think that's all pretty obvious. How do brands like that who have had these missteps rebuild that confidence now in a world where that video is going to haunt her? I mean, she took it down, but you know, <laughs> the internet remembers forever. It's right. people have right. like remixed it into TikToks at this point. It's, it's pretty ugly. Yeah. I I think in an age when we talk so much about authenticity, with many brands, I want to say, well, you want to be authentic, but authentic to what? What you know, what what is kind of that that dark, deep core that you want people to better understand? Mm. First, are there things there that for which you are are proud and, and rightfully so? So you want to share them with the world? Or do you realize what's there and realize you need to fix some things yeah. first? Or maybe you need to fix some things and prototype in public and bring us along on your journey. That is not a bad thing at all. And I think when when individuals and those sort of personal brands have those moments that in which they expose themselves, mm -hmm. we need to ask, their audiences need to ask, well, is this the the authentic person or not? You know, right. I mean, when um when Mel Gibson was drunk and then became anti-Semitic. Because that's the natural course of action. <laughs> right. He became right. anti-Semitic because yeah, he yeah. was drinking. He was drinking the anti-Semitic beer. You could pour vodka on a turnip, but it doesn't make it start like spewing anti-Semitic slurs. Um, well, we have to ask, well, is that the real you? Or or is that the the aberration? Like yes. what what is real there? Yes. And and when when someone uh, I think it was Oprah that said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. So I think it, it's incumbent on her audience to say, is this who she is? Yeah, and there have been a number of people in the comments who are like, okay, this is like the seventh time you've done this, right? Like, yeah. And and part of you is like, well, why are you still following her, right? So, <laughs> so I, I mean, I think that stuff is, I think that stuff is really interesting because I think you know, there's this huge opportunity for her to now say like i messed up i'm learning here are the steps and in the vulnerability actually get people to lean in yeah. even more to her right well or that, that's an opportunity to to prototype in public to mm -hmm. and, and i think for a lot of brands they're going through this right now too when they've maybe taken a stand like she's taken a stand on on authenticity and being relatable and then exposes that oh she has this relatability problem because maybe not everybody wants to relate to that level of, of arrogance and disdain. Yeah, um, right. Disdain is a very good word for the emotion that she was given out. Right. That right. Yeah. And, and there can be all kinds of reasons for that. Maybe she had a bad day, in which case you're like, okay, well that's, that's inconsistent with how we know her to be. But right. when you have many bad days and people can, I mean, many there's a, data, there's a trend. 
yeah, that's 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 a line. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we can also see a trajectory from a line. And you wonder, do you, as you said, do you want to keep following her? Do you want to be a part of that trajectory? But as you said, I, it also offers an opportunity. And I think when brands have said, you know, we we support these different social issues, whether it's supporting um, Me Too or or Black Lives Matter, right? Or like Nike with Colin Kaepernick, right? Got tons and tons of of, of flack and also lots of love. Right, right. And when brands have have kind of gone out on a limb, been vulnerable and said, we're putting a stake in the ground to say, this is what we support, only to then hear from maybe within the organization, like, well, wait, if, if you support that, if you support Black Lives Matter, well, what are you doing to support efforts around equity and diversity and inclusion and whatnot here in your own organization? Right. I think that's an opportunity then to say, there are problems external, there are problems internal, Let's work on them both at the same time. We don't have to ignore the external stuff because we have that stuff here as well. If anything, okay, let's prototype in public. Let's let's show everyone how we think that it is first important to evolve, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. we think that we're going to be, we're going to first acknowledge the problem yeah. and then demonstrate, offer accountability and transparency to improve because that allows those brands and that can allow individuals too the opportunity to say in a messed up culture we are messing up too in a racist mm -hmm. society turns out we are racist too here's how we're going to improve let us be a beacon to other organizations let me be a beacon to other people to say yeah i need to do this too here's here's my progress let mm -hmm. let me evolve in public so you can see what this evolution looks like and maybe cheer me on, but more importantly, maybe address it yourself too. That takes vulnerability, um, but I think that is the ultimate measure of authenticity. When we can, when we can better the uh, to me, the measure of authenticity is how we how we align our actions with our values. It's the distance between our actions and values, and when we can demonstrate the work to bring those things more in alignment, more more in consonance, then then I think that we can we can be a part of leading that path forward. I love that statement. Authenticity is a distance between your action and your values. I think that's that's it's so good because I think, you know, you talk about voice, you talk about volume, you talk about vulnerability, you talk about values, but then there's like the anti-V, which is veneer, right? Like everybody puts up yeah. this veneer. Yeah. So like every every company's putting out these Black Lives Matter statements in the summer. And then you're like, uh, your entire C-suite is white and right. your entire board is white. And hmm. <laughs> We're back at Kerwin Williams, but it isn't Periwinkle. It's all shades of beige. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there's there people can talk a very good game. They can design a very good game. But if they're not living a very good game, then there's no trust that's there. Right. 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 I think, though, we... We love the story of we love the story of the prodigal son returning home. We love the story of of kind of brands and organizations that go bad and then repent and yes. truly acknowledge their problems, yes. apologize, demonstrate what they're going to do so that they don't mess up again. So this problem does not happen again. And then next time they're presented with that opportunity to mess up, they don't. Yes. I mean, that's the story of repentance. And we cheer for that. I think most people don't want to drag down the people in the organizations around them. They want to, they want to see them succeed. And, and I think once we, once we see that kind of evolution, it, it's, a it's a good opportunity because it motivates others. It motivates other brands and people as well. You know, one of the things that you mentioned when we talked about doing the show is that, um, uh, one of the themes that you rep that, that you repeat in the book a number of times is that um, cynics look at the world and say it's worse, right? Whereas yeah. designers, writers, people who embrace and brainstorm and build ideas and brands, we are the ones, we look at the world and we're like, it can be better, right? Let's work yeah. to make it better. So is do how do we build more you know, quixotic, naive, raging optimists, idealists like us and help the cynics sort of believe, right? Like, I mean, I, 
I, I dropped out of law school 30 years ago to join a presidential campaign of a man who's like, I still believe in a place called hope, right? Like, it's like <laughs> I am, I am, I am, I am that dork through and through. And, and, and I, I was actually just saying this to a friend this morning during our workout that she was talking a little bit about it, sort of having her heart broken by people who have let her down during uh, mm -hmm. the pandemic. And I said, you know, I'd rather remain the person who gets my heart broken who falls in love over and over and over again, who, who, who believes that things can be great, who, who, who wants to build somebody up and believes that they've learned, but you know, because that's just a better place to live than this cynical place where you're like carrying around poison darts all the time and actually sort of ingesting a little bit of it themselves. But how do we do that? How mm. do we, how do we bring more people into, you know, the world of wonder of, of this, you know, radical optimism? I think we stop calling it naive. We stop <laughs> calling it just radical optimism and say, it is not radical optimism. It is responsible. It is personal responsibility to say that there are problems out there and I'm not going to turn away from them. I'm not going to just adopt that sort of cool shroud of cynicism that says, oh, they'll always be there. There have always been these problems. Far be it from me to think I can do anything about it. I think it is personally responsible to say, I see these problems, if not now, when, if not who, me, uh, if I notice it, I should work on fixing it. And I think we all have different degrees of capability and access and, and personal networks and personal resources to, to use to address social problems. But one of the things that, that I write in the book, and I think one of the one of the elements of, of upbringing and reform Judaism that resonates with me the most is that just because you can't fix all the things does not free you from the obligation to try and it does not free you from the obligation to do what you can. And I don't view that as, as naive. I view that, uh, and I don't view dropping out of law school to, to follow a politician as naive. I think it's probably looking at the, the next best step to say, if, if law school is the best way to, to make the, the impact that I wanna make, I will stay that course. If this is a faster way to make the impact that I wanna make and to do the most good, I need to change course. And that's, that is brave, that is risky, that is vulnerable, but ultimately I think that is responsible. Because there are so many paths that are prescribed and obvious. And um, and I would say to a degree, those paths are also cynical. Because if cynicism says, if people that are cynical look at the world around them and say, it's worse, I can't do anything about it, that's limiting. They've put up those walls to say, mm -hmm. I don't want any more information. There's nothing you can tell me that will change my mind. I think skeptics look at the world as it is and say, okay, I don't believe this on first blush. Let me keep researching. Let me keep digging in. Let me, let me keep thinking about this. And um, maybe that is a, is a sign of optimism of saying, I know there's more out there for me to learn. And I believe that I have the, the skills and resources to keep learning. And, and I, I champion that idea of, of skepticism, not cynicism. And then, yeah, I think then there's the designers that look at the world and say, this is not enough. I'm going to take the knowledge that I've accrued. I'm going to take the personal connections. I'm going to, I'm going to take maybe that that's the radical optimism, the belief that that I can continue to learn and do something about it. And I think that we help people move from cynicism to a state of of confidence and hope and and belief in the future and belief in themselves by setting them up for success, by continuing to encourage them to do the work. Because um, like one of the stories that I share in, in Trustworthy from uh, Jack Bishop, he's the, the chief creative officer at America's Test Kitchen, which is a mind blowing place, especially yes. if you're not much of a cook. Um, <laughs> but, but he said, success breeds confidence. When we set people up to, to learn, get a little something right and feel good about it, then they wanna do it more. And going back to like what we were saying about parenting, even for like little kids, it, it's taken me a while to learn this. But um, when we when we offer them sort of right sized challenges so that they can 
get a little bit of confidence in something, that's what encourages them to want to do more, to kind of keep expanding their worlds and their sense of capability. And I think for, for cynics too, once they see that they are able to create positive change, that maybe it's by voting or donating or supporting a candidate or um, or learning something and then teaching someone else or, or taking in a bit of knowledge that causes them to shift their beliefs and their behavior, if we can help set them up for success, I think they start to replace cynicism with confidence and desire to keep doing those things. It's such an interesting uh, lens on it because when my kids were really little, uh, they we send them to a Montessori school and everything in Montessori is like right sized, like all the things are right sized, and 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 you know they do things like polish shoes for days and days so that they could figure out the the fine motor skills so they can learn how to write, right? Like there's like mm -hmm. a method to the madness, and you're like, why is my kid? I'm paying like private school Montessori tuition for like preschool so they can polish shoes. Like what's yeah. going on? Yeah. But then suddenly they. No, they can write cursive. Um, and and I was talking to one of the teachers in one of the early parent teacher conferences, and I, I was uh, I don't know, I made some side comment about how like oh if they only they can make their own breakfast, life would be great. And she's like, well, why can't they? And she's like, what if you? I'm like, well, they'll they'll spill the milk everywhere. She's like, well, what if you just got like a small pitcher of milk and put it on the bottom shelf of the refrigerator, and you put the cereal at a low shelf in the pantry? And I was like, and she's like, and you put the bowl and the you know you like help like together got the bowl and the and the spoon out the night before and put it on the counter. And I was like, oh, what? It blew my mind. And suddenly we were able to sleep in a little bit and my kids were able to get up and they made themselves breakfast and they were so proud of themselves to make themselves wow. breakfast that then it was like, they couldn't wait to be old enough to turn on the stove and like make eggs. And they were so like, it was like, we helped them to like in these like little baby steps to get to a place where they trusted themselves to be able to do this. But it also had to live inside of the space where they knew we trusted them also right. Right? right so it's like it has to be it's it's almost like you're creating this trust ecosystem around where everybody the more we trusted them the more they trusted themselves the more they trusted themselves the more we trusted them and 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 again that goes back to the sort of two-way dialogue between brands and their customers or news outlets and their you know readers or viewers or you know us with any you know our clients with anybody in our lives is that we have to create the space where we are um having this two-way conversation. Right, right. And I think that the the foundation for that is respect. Maybe it starts with with respect for our audiences. And I think that's mm. what a lot of a lot of brands, a lot of speakers get wrong. They think, well, they've got to have faith in me first. And no, it has to start with I respect the audience enough to to kind of bring their own ideas and their own intelligence to the topic and to be able to run with some of the ideas then that I'm presenting to them, that that I don't need to spell out everything because they're smart people too. And, and I think offering that level of respect, whether it's to your kids when they're really young or to an audience or to consumers, that's where we begin to form, as you said, that, that kind of trust ecosystem where they gain confidence in their own knowledge, their ability to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing is that that's what helps to insulate people or inoculate people maybe from, from gaslighting mm. so that they're not just at the mercy of, of media or politicians or other organizations saying, no, 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 you, you need to listen to me. Don't trust the evidence of your own eyes. Don't, don't listen to any other information sources on this only me. And when that happens, when people are kind of marinating in that that sort of media diet, and they, they lose faith in themselves, they lose confidence, they, they lose confidence that they can affect change. And, and when we do that to our kids by taking away the things in which they can be proud by limiting their own capabilities, it's not good when we do that to our audiences by demanding their their compliance and and their sort of blind faith in us that's not good it's not healthy but when we when we can take would be cynics or or people that are otherwise kind of felled over by by present context and and lacking that belief and instead build them up and build their confidence in their ability to do research and make good decisions and and to collect ideas from multiple sources 
that's what makes us a stronger society too. So I think this is not just about fixing your brand or fixing your engagement with your audience. It's about fixing our world as well. Yeah, but also at a time where people are getting those messages of, I trust you, you know, you know that that's not really what happened in the election. I trust that you're smarter than that. Like we're giving people the messages to tell them that we trust that they're going to continue down the same siloed one source news and not actually question and get smarter. Right. So there's, yeah. it's almost like, I don't know, like reverse gaslighting or something like that. I don't, I don't know what the term, I'm sure you know what the term it's for when you like convince the people who are wrong to stay wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like you're setting up this like straw man and and then not knocking it over, but, but to man, identity you, it, right. What's that? It's like, it's like, it becomes their identity that they become so, yeah. um, yeah. they become so, I, I, Adam Grant and think again, uh, uh, think again, talks about it in terms of like scientists and, and preachers and politicians. And like, you become so, so convinced in your idea that it then becomes your identity, that it's like, you, you don't trust yourself. If you're going to be in that uncertain world of, I don't quite know what's on the other side of being a skeptic, I'm going right. to learn more. So I'm going to stay in the cynicism. Right. And when, when that becomes like uh, Jamel Bowie writes about it as cultural identity. Mm -hmm. And when people identify as whether it's um, an anti-vaxxer or an environmentalist or someone that sees themselves as the supporter of just one particular politician, yep. right or wrong, whatever that person does, it doesn't matter. Whatever new science comes out, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. They've already got their identity. They're, they're set with that. They've, they've bought that couch and that is the couch they will own for life. And and I think that when when people are forced to confront ideas, that's one thing. But when they're forced to confront themselves and the foundation they have for themselves, the foundation that they've built around an idea that's shaky, that's when we confront other issues of imposter syndrome, saying like, well, maybe I, I don't have such a strong foundation under this idea, but I have to grab onto it because without this, I'm kind of at the mercy of the waves, kind of lost in the storm. I think by building up people's confidence around, around their, their skills and around their ability to do research and about and around their own kind of lived experience and the wisdom that they gain from that, that's what frees them from maybe those those false beliefs or or ideas that that lack a strong foundation. It's tricky because like if your lived experience is that doors open up for you, you mm. don't spend a lot of time wondering if they're open up for you because you're qualified right? or because you're just a straight white cisgendered male, right? And then when suddenly maybe the same doors are opening up, but the rooms are more crowded, you're like, hmm, there's less opportunity here for me. And I'm noticing that these people don't look like me. And there, it's it becomes hard to question the identity of is that because I'm not as good, I just had privilege, or because they're getting in here because of how they look and they don't deserve to be here, right? Like you, you, you can you people will take their lived experience and they, I think they don't necessarily use it to ask questions because it's threatening right? It's scary. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, you can look at it everywhere from the Trump voter all the way to like, you know, 1939 Germany, right? Like, and, and beyond yeah. like people like it's, it's like the use of propaganda, um, I think is, it is, it is poison to trust, but what it does is it tells people trust that instinct that you had it better before and don't question things. Right, right. And and I think that when when we have propaganda around an identity, mm -hmm. that's dangerous rather yes. than encouraging people to to separate from the identity and instead examine the merit of different ideas. But I think it goes back to that idea uh, of confidence and in the foundation on which you you ground that confidence. Is it around who you are or the skill that you build along the way? Which, yeah, maybe there is an element of privilege in allowing you to first even build that skill. Um, but I think that we can take that step back too to to start to dig in and say, well, what are the privileges that allow me to open certain doors or that have opened certain doors to me? Um, but yeah, I think that that's exactly the question that we need yeah. to be asking right now. 
And does the question of vulnerability, does it put demands on those who have been, um, uh, 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 who have been traditionally outside of the room? I mean, like if you, if, if, if I'm thinking about this in terms of, um, I, I remember uh, uh, Rachel Maddow saying uh, she did this very impassioned plea on MSNBC one night where she was like, if you're gay, come out, mm -hmm. talk to your neighbors, talk to your coworkers. Hate cannot survive people knowing people in real life, right? If you're like, oh, my uncle Bob, my neighbor Joe, my friend Sue, like they're gay and they're normal. So I guess gay people are normal. And I remember that really divided the LGBTQ community because they were like, yeah, we should definitely do it because that's how we make progress. Or no, why should it be on us? Why do we have to be born? Why do we have to come out and be vulnerable in order for other people to make progress. So I'm interested in this last V of vulnerability and sort of if you have a lot of privilege, like I, you know, as you know, went through, um, I went through a lot of health stuff this summer and I went live on Facebook every day about it because I knew that it was going to turn out okay. Right. Like I had the privilege to know that things were going to be fine. So I could talk about it. And I got praise at the wazoo for being vulnerable. And I was like, that wasn't vulnerable. I was just bringing you guys through the journey with me. Yeah, there was a chance it might not have all worked out well, but pretty much I was like, I have enough privilege to know that even if it didn't, things would be okay. But then you have people who aren't and we're asking them to be vulnerable in the space. Where do we draw the line between vulnerability, creating trust and vulnerability being like, you know, uh, experience porn, right? Like life experience. Porn. Right. Right. Well, I mean, vulnerability is the is the cost of transparency. But I think that we need to look at that from a, an intersectional perspective to say that not everyone has the same experience. For for Rachel Maddow to make that uh, request of of the LGBT community in her audience, knowing that they don't all share the same privileges that that she has as a as a white woman in a at literally and figuratively a pulpit there right. with a platform right. um, and with a certain amount of wealth. That mm -hmm. is not an entirely common experience. I think it goes back to that idea of personal responsibility. We all should do the things that we can do, but not everyone can do the same thing. So, mm -hmm. so if you are in that position of, of relative comfort or have the privilege and uh, knowing that you have the support around you to to live your life with a degree of transparency, um, whether it's showing and sharing the, the kind of medical experience you're going through or, um, or sharing more of who you are with your friends and neighbors and community, that's great, but that's not, not the shared experience of everyone. And mm -hmm. I think maybe this is where empathy gets in the way of compassion, of saying, mm -hmm. I can relate to your experience because that is my experience too. If I can share in this way, you can too. I mean, maybe that's a message of support, but mm -hmm. it, it centers the speaker, not the yes. person hearing that who's saying, that's that's not quite my experience. How dare you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think instead to meet people where they are, to just say, Yes, you have you have these attributes that maybe you could share, but you know you best. You know your your constraints and capabilities best. Yes. That centers the other person a lot yes. more. And ultimately I think it invites greater, maybe greater participation from um from the people that we do hope to rally, but it invites people to participate in a way that is right and appropriate to them and yes. in their communities, and they know that best. Yes. Yeah, well, I love what you said earlier about just because you can't do all the things doesn't mean you can't do something, right? You can't do right. some of the things. And what are you going to do? And everyone has a different place and a different um, a different privilege and a different ability to be able to do it. So um, how is it launching this book in a pandemic? Different than I ever expected. <laughs> yeah. But, but isn't everything. <laughs> Best laid plans, right? Um, no, in in a lot of ways, it's been good. I think that the forced isolation and time at home, um, and as well as the the privilege that I have to be able to focus on the book, is what 
what allowed me to still meet all like the milestones and, and get it to the manuscript to the publisher on time, mm -hmm. like, partner with the publisher through the design process. And now um, somebody reached out to me the other day. So the book came out beginning of March and I've been speaking at a number of events through different bookstores all across the country and, and meetups all across the world. And, um, and someone said, wow, that's, that's really cool that you're doing an old fashioned book tour. I'm thinking, I don't know if there's anything old fashioned about this, but yeah, it's been great to partner with all of these different small independent bookstores. Yep. And um, most of them are in cities where pre pandemic, I've spoken multiple times over the past 10, 15 years and, and already know folks in the design and content communities there. And, um, and now we're doing all the events over zoom. I don't think had the book come out in normal times, I don't think I would be speaking at nearly as many events. Isn't that amazing? You can get to more yeah. events in more cities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did a an event that was sort of like a lunch and learn fireside conversation type thing in Philadelphia at lunchtime. Then I did a podcast in the afternoon and then spoke in San Francisco at a guest lecture that evening. Amazing. Many time zones. Also, yay, Zoom. <laughs> Yeah. And you could still be home for dinner with your family. Exactly. Like, yeah. When is that going to happen ever? Yeah. So um, where can people find more, uh, find out more about you, my friend, Marmot Bloodstain, <laughs> Margot Bloomstein, um, yeah, coming and your to a, great coming book, road near you. <laughs> yeah, coming to a road near you and your great book, Trustworthy, How the Smartest Brands Beat Cynicism and Bridge the Trust Gap. You can find me all too often on Twitter at mbloomstein and appropriateinc.com slash trustworthy. That's where you can drop your email for my newsletter, find out more about when I am coming to a, a town or bookstore or Zoom screen near you, <laughs> computer <laughs> monitor near you. A computer um, monitor near you, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's available everywhere books are sold. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Margot, for spending the morning with us. Thank you. This is so much fun.